For a country straddling a seismic hotspot, Japan is better prepared for earthquakes than most. But the sheer size of the one in March 2011 took even seismologists by surprise. Japan is probably one of the best earthquake research programs in the world, but we were not able to anticipate this kind of event. And I think a lot of seismologists, a lot of earth scientists felt, felt very badly about that. 30 kilometers below the Pacific Ocean, where one tectonic plate buckles under another in the Japan Trench, the seafloor ripped apart. The fault unzipped along a length of 500 kilometers in a megathrust earthquake of magnitude 9. Several hundred kilometers away in Tokyo, skyscrapers started to sway. The fault moved a lot, more than we've ever seen before. It moved like 50 or 60 meters, which is just a huge amount. The Great Tohoku earthquake was the largest ever recorded in Japan's history. It dropped the level of this coastline by about a metre and shoved the entire main island of Japan to the east by up to four metres. So great was the shock it knocked the earth off its axis and as the whole planet shuddered, giant icebergs cracked off Antarctica. And of course, when you have that much fault movement on the ocean floor, then you get a very large tsunami. Less than an hour after the quake, a massive tsunami slammed into the northeastern coast. Tragically, many of the 18 and a half thousand people killed or still missing must have believed they were protected by the world's biggest network of seawalls and tsunami barriers. This is the highest hill in Yuri Aga district. So it was a natural place for people to evacuate to when the tsunami hit. But even on top of this hill, the wave was over my head. Hundreds died here when the eight metre tsunami raced up the nearby river and swept away the town and fishing port. So how do we know if this catastrophe was a rare event or one that could happen again soon. To find out needs a much deeper view of history, way beyond the last century or so. Our geological evidence is not well incorporated in uh, our disaster prevention plan. So uh, now uh, we are thinking uh, to go back further to several thousand years and then uh, making a disaster prevention plan for uh, future tsunami risk assessment. Geologist Kazuhisa Goto reads the prehistoric record of tsunami from what they've written into the landscape. Like time capsules, old sediments hold evidence about the reach of tsunamis in the distant past. His team samples hundreds of sediment cores in lines across the Sendai Plain of northern Japan. Our transect is coming from the, the shore and then it's passing through here to, um, let's say, uh, three kilometer further inland from here. More than a thousand years ago, a mega tsunami called Jogan tore through here. Amid the dust and rubble of reconstruction work, Goto shows me Jogan's geological fingerprint in one of his sediment cores. This sun layer is deposited by the 2011 Tohokuoki tsunami event. You can see a uh, yellow sun here. So it's probably a uh, 1611 Keijo tsunami deposit. So that was the Samurai Asia here. And then this is a 869 Jogan uh, tsunami deposit. So that's 1,145 years ago. That's right, yeah. Before 2011, the inundation limits for ancient tsunami were defined by the end of the sand layer. But the recent tsunami has changed how scientists interpret the geological record. We found that the sun's thickness is 30 centimetres in a coastal area. Then it's thinning and thinning further inland. While the sand here stopped 2.8 kilometres inland, the water continued much further 
to 4.5 kilometers. So then uh, there is a big gap between the sand uh, limit and also the, the water limit. So we need to think how to fill this gap. You're looking for the missing set of That's right, right, yeah. And that missing link is mud. Finer than sand, it's carried further inland by the wave. So the height of the tsunamis mm -hmm. are likely to be bigger than previously thought. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it could be. So uh, in, in case of the 2011 deposit, sand distribution is just 60% uh, of the tsunami inundation uh, limit. Discovering mud in land nearly half as far again as the sand is a crucial clue. It means the inundation limits of previous mega tsunami have been underestimated. And if their true size had been known, maybe the international airport would have been built somewhere else. The Sendai airport has been rebuilt since the tsunami sent cars and trees hurtling through here. But a graphic reminder remains of the horror of that day, a water level more than three metres high. Informed by their sediment cores and measurements of flow depth, Daisuke Sugawara recreates the 2011 tsunami in a computer model. Now, uh, this is the primary part of the main wave, and this scale sh shows the sediment concentration within the water column. For the first time, the videos provide information he can use to validate his simulation. It's very important. The video provides us the good estimate of flow speed and also the temporal change of flow directions and so many things. Further north, on the Sanriku coast, the jagged coastline even looks like giant waves. The enclosed bays made the tsunami behave much differently than on the flat coastal plain. Where at sea level, this seawall is 10 metres high. Here was a gate and it's removed by a tsunami. So it's just smashed the gate, mm -hmm. it was coming over the wall. In this narrow valley, it must have been like water pouring too quickly into a funnel. Yeah, so uh, water concentrated and uh, getting higher and higher. How high did it go? Uh, it said around the 28 metre. 28 metres, yeah. so that's 10 metres. 28 mm -hmm. metres around the edge of this valley. That's right. Can you see traces of that along the... Mm -hmm. There, you can see the fence and it was partly broken. So that means that the tsunami reached uh, somewhere on the top of the, of the fence. The current was so strong, it rolled massive boulders far inland. Have you been able to estimate the velocity of the water flow here? Yeah, so uh, we use the boulder to estimate how uh, fast tsunami current is required, and it should be uh, faster than uh, 9 meters per second. 9 meters a second, so roughly 30 kilometers an That's hour. That's right, yeah. That's faster than most people can run. It's to almost uh, one kilometer from the coastline. Further up the valley is one of the boulders from the 2011 tsunami. The team estimates its mass and calculates the flow speed needed to wash it here. And just nearby is an even larger boulder that locals say has always been here, a relic from a tsunami in prehistoric times, possibly Jogan. Okay. If we can identify the Jogan uh, tsunami evidence in the further north, then we need to extend the fault. So that means that the, uh, the, the magnitude must be much larger and larger. Add to that their discovery of a longer inundation limit for Jogan, and there's evidence of a much stronger earthquake back in 869 AD. The modeler says that the, the Jogan magnitude should be larger than 8.6. So is that fault in the Japan Trench generating magnitude 9 earthquakes once in a thousand years, or in a more random pattern? The surprising answer lies deep offshore. An international expedition has been drilling into the fault, in water seven kilometres deep, to investigate the cause of its massive slip. Seismologist Jim Morrie is one of the project's leaders. One of the most important things that is not at all well understood in seismology is friction. How easily or how hard does it take, or how much force does it take to move the fault? They found friction in the fault to be very low, 
because of a layer of deep sea sediments that's very slippery. <laughs> These very soft muds. One thing we've identified is something that's called smegtite. Smegtite is a well-known clay and it's well known for its very low frictional property. A lubricated fault explains why the slip was so sudden and large and how intervals between magnitude 9 quakes may not be constant. Well, this complication is also driven by this frictional level, these low, low slip environments which sort of, sort of can go at almost any time once you get an earthquake started. And the knock-on effects are major. Tokyo is surrounded by a belt of faults called the Kanto Seismic Corridor, now under greater strain since the Tohoku quake. The 32 million residents of Greater Tokyo have long been bracing for the next big one. And the 2011 earthquake added to that fear because it increased the seismic hazards here. The chance that a large shock of more than magnitude 7 will hit Tokyo in the next few years has now more than doubled. Since the main quake, the probability has risen from 7 to 17%, a 1 in 6 chance. These are very low probability events that probably won't happen in your lifetime, but could. And if they do happen, then the consequences are very high. Three years on, as shattered defences are rebuilt, the tsunami detectives want the engineers to take geological history into account. This new seawall stretches for 40 kilometres along the Sendai coast. Given the height of the 2011 tsunami, mm -hmm. is this seawall big enough? Um, this seawall is designed for a um, much more smaller one. It's 7.2 metres high, but the tsunami wave here was 10 metres. Throughout the Pacific Rim, wherever subduction zones have slippery clay, giant earthquakes and mega tsunami remain an unpredictable threat. This is really just the beginning uh, in terms of understanding the geology and using that to understand these big slips of um, subduction zones all over the world. <laughs> 